it's Havala Kennington, and I'm jumping in for a Q&A. We're going to talk about why God gave us feelings, the common misconceptions in our spiritual life about feelings, maybe what we were taught, and uh, even some maybe theology that's kept us from not knowing why or how to manage our feelings. And I'm going to answer your questions, whatever questions you have. So we had a conversation yesterday and we had so much response. I realized that me going live with you guys and letting you guys ask some questions and helping answer some of the things that you're thinking about uh, was helpful. So I love that. So welcome, welcome, welcome to our live. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes. Um, well, first of all, what I want to do is share this to my group. I have a group, um, our Truth Table members and communities. So I'm going to share that really quick. And um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, feelings. Why, why we get it wrong so much in the church. So Rebecca, I see you. I'm glad you're here. Are we allowed to share this? Absolutely. If you're watching this and you want to share this on your wall, you absolutely can. This is a public group. Um, and this is our Truth to Table community, but we're going through our I Do Boundaries series. Now, one of the weeks we talked about, one of the days in our 15-day study, we talked about feelings. Now, I wanted to tell you a story, and then I'm going to answer your questions. But when I was a young woman, about 15 years old, I went on a ministry team. It was a ministry group where we did six weeks up San Francisco into Alaska and back down. And there was a group of, I don't know, a hundred of us young people that did this kind of missions, missionary moment in the summer. And I was really struggling. Like I remember the leader telling us to go out and spend time with God. And here I am 15. I don't know how to hear God's voice. I don't know how, what he's saying to me. And I would get my journal and I would sit up in these like fields or on a mountain and like try to write out what God was saying and it was like nothing. And finally, I was so discouraged that I finally went to one of my leaders and I said, I'm having a really hard time. I can't hear God. I don't know what I'm missing. You're giving us an hour every day to have a quiet time and I can't hear him. And the gentleman that was leading us at the time said, I'll tell you what it is but I need you to meet me in the cafeteria tonight after dinner where I can talk to you about what it is. So I thought he was going to give me this secret to all the struggles that I had been having. So I get all excited and I'm going through my regular day and all the stuff they had us doing. And eventually I go to the, um, I have dinner and I get all ready and I get, you know, I ask permission to go down to the cafeteria and talk to this leader. And I finally make my way and, I'm in, I'm in Anchorage, Alaska at this huge church downstairs. There's a cafeteria. There are people in the cafeteria, but he's sitting at this table and I walk over to this table and I sit down where he's sitting. And he is this guy who was, you know, a spiritual leader. I want to say like this guru of, of spiritual things. And so I sit down and he goes, well, tell me what's going on. And I said, well, I'm, I'm having a hard time. You know, I don't feel like I can hear God's voice. I don't feel like... Um, I know what he's doing. I, I feel like it's like a a ceiling. I can't I can't hear him, and I'm struggling, and I don't know what to do. And he said, "I'll tell you what it is." And I said, "Okay." And he brings up this piece of paper, and he writes. He kind of draws this like truck. So it's this car, this truck on this piece of paper, and he draws a little driver in the front seat, and he drives the cargo like the little cargo passenger. Um, whatever you call it, behind it. And he says, you see, and he wrote feelings in the cargo, like that little box in the back of the car that you're pulling, feelings. And then he put an arrow in, as the driver, as the spirit, and he put a little arrow on top of the head. And he says to me at this moment, the problem is your feelings are driving the truck not your spirit and the mind of Christ. He said, you have to stop letting your feelings dominate your life. Now, I want you to know I loved God. I want to do the right thing. When he said that, you know what I thought? Immediately I thought, oh, so feelings are ungodly and spiritual things are not connected to feelings. This is what I thought. And I'm telling you, it's a negative way to think. It's the wrong way to think, but I'm going to tell you what I thought. 
I thought, oh, feelings are what the enemy uses against us. And if we're going to be spiritual people, then we just need to let the spirit and the mind of Christ lead us and feelings are going to drag us down. Now, as a 15 year old, I, I immediately begin to understand that this is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. And I say to him, oh, so feelings are not to be involved in our spiritual life. And he said, no, they're, they're in the back. They're being carried along. Well, that worked fine as a young adult and even as a, you know, a, a single woman living for God and all the things. But it didn't work when I find myself in the middle of being an ordained minister and I've got postpartum depression. I'm diagnosed with it and I feel horrible. And I feel like I can't fix myself and I feel stuck and I feel humiliated and I feel ashamed that I'm a minister and I'm dealing with depression and I'm a minister and I'm dealing with anxiety and I love God and I'm doing all the things that they're telling us to do. I mean, I'm, I'm preaching the word of God and I, I have these really negative feelings and I start to do the internal narrative that I was taught for many years, which is. You need to ignore the feelings. Feelings will go away. Just suck it up, do what you need to do, and the feelings will go away. Can I just tell you something and ask you something? Have you ever been in a situation where you cannot stop feeling something? Have you ever been in a situation where your feelings, they overwhelm you, they come up, from inside of you and, and they just consume you? Have you ever had a broken heart? Have you ever gone through grief? Have you ever been so disappointed? You know, the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Have you ever had hope deferred where your heart is sick and you can't figure it out? Yeah, me too, me too. And I realized at that moment that I didn't know how to fix myself. So I ended up going to a Christian counselor and sitting down with her. And I explained to her what I was going through. And she, the first thing she did for me was she acknowledged what I was feeling and respected it. And instead of judging me or ridiculing me or um, shutting me down, she acknowledged it and you know what happened the moment she acknowledged that i was not okay and i couldn't fix it and i was overwhelmed and i had anxiety and i felt depressed and i felt ashamed that i was feeling all these things guess what immediately when she acknowledged it and she began to give me insight into what was happening i be my hope level began to rise so instead of her discounting and disrespecting my emotions which often when someone does that, our hope level decreases. When we begin to acknowledge the feelings and acknowledge that they're there, our hope level rises because empathy is the atmosphere in which we could change. When we know that there's empathy and that we are not broken beyond repair or that we can change and be healed in a loving and accepting way and not an ashamed you know, get it together behind closed doors, but we can be broken and still be worthy. Things just work, right? And so I went on this journey in my life as a minister and a leader and an ordained pastor to figure out why feelings were powerful and why did God give us feelings? And I would suggest the church has got this wrong and people of faith have got this wrong because we end up acting as if feelings have a moral value. And scripturally, doctrinally, theologically, I should say, feelings have no moral value. The Bible says to be angry and sin not. So when it says that, it's showing us that there are two things happening. You have the emotion of anger, the feeling of anger, but you can not sin in the midst of that, which tells me that they are two separate, separate experiences. Our feelings aren't negative. Our emotions aren't ungodly. Our feelings aren't going to lead us astray. Our feelings aren't the negative part the enemy uses to hurt us. Our feelings give us insight into what's happening on the inside of us. Guess who gave you emotions? God. Guess who gave you deep feelings? God. 
he created all of that. He's not disappointed that you feel certain things or that you're experiencing certain things. He created you to feel it because he wants to use those emotions for relationship. So I want to explain this to you for a minute, and I'm sure this should bring a little more insight into what you're experiencing. So uh, have you ever been driving in your car and all of a sudden a light comes up on your dashboard? If you've ever had that, just type yes in the comment box. Interact with me for just a minute. If you've ever had a light come up, whether it's fuel, uh, whether it's um, your engine light, just type yes. Okay, so there's quite a few of us that have had this experience. So when we get that engine light, could you imagine if you're in the car with me, you're my passenger, I'm in the front driving my car, and all of a sudden my check engine light comes up, and I go, oh my gosh, would you just shut up? Come, let me drive. You are such a distraction. You are such a, you are, you are so dominating and you're of the devil. That engine light, you're of the devil. I rebuke you. Get away from me in Jesus name. <laughs> you guys would be sitting in the passenger seat being like, wait, I'm sorry, Havilah. Why are we rebuking your engine light? Why are we saying that's of the devil? I mean, it's just there to tell you what's going on. And this is the issue we do. This is what we do in church and in our faith lives. All of a sudden we have an emotion of anger or maybe not a positive emotion, okay? But but it doesn't feel positive, I should say, because they don't have any moral value, but it's not a it's not a joyful, but it's a negative or an anxious. We have this emotion. And what we've done in church is like, get away from me, Satan. Anxiety, I reject you and I rebuke you, right? Fear, get away from me. How dare you? You know, I'm I'm you're a distraction. Now, there are times when we have to say, oh, that engine light is just, it just goes off on random times. It means nothing. I had it checked out. There's no legitimacy to that light. It just goes off when my tire gets low, the engine light goes off and it's weird. I had it checked out. It's fine. But most often, if you're a responsible adult, you would see that light and you would go, okay, I need to check it out. This is a signal. Our emotions are signals. Our feelings are the lights in our life. And it's the thing that says to us, it's time to check under the hood. That's what our feelings are for. They're the triggers. They tell us, oh, you saw how you were angry? Oh, you felt that anxiety? Let's go, let's research that. Because our feelings come often from our belief systems and our values and what we believe about life. And so our feelings are an overflow of what's happening on the inside of us. And so what happens often in our spiritual life is we reject the feelings. Well, how do you think God's going to show you what's under the hood? Just think about it for a minute. How is God going to interrupt you? How is he going to heal you? How is he going to set you free? How is he going to speak to you? What if he's using your emotions to speak to you about things that are hidden deep inside? What if you stopped disrespecting yourself because you have an emotion? And what if you started being respectful to who you are and acknowledge it? Now, if you have fear right now, even hearing that, I want to challenge you that if your instant thought is, I don't want to feel that, or they should feel that or if everybody feels it, then it would be just chaotic. Let me just say that that is, that's not true. That's actually not helpful. And if anybody in your life is not allowing you to feel something, they are being disrespectful to you. You say, I'm really mad. Oh, you're not mad. You're fine. You know, that makes me scared. You're not scared. You're fine. Have you ever had someone in your life do that to you? You go, I'm really hurt. You're not hurt. You're not hurt. When someone does that, it tells you something. And this is what it tells you. That that person does not have the tools to experience someone in their atmosphere being having that emotion. So when we had a caregiver in our life, where we were not allowed to be angry or we were not allowed to be emotional or we are not allowed to feel certain things, that doesn't show anything about you. That shows us what your caregiver was like. That shows us that your caregiver, the one that raised you, 
did not have the tools to know what to do with those emotions. And so they wrote them off as negative, scary. I don't want anything to do with it. Even not important that it, it, that it actually showed you that that was a negative emotion. So if you had a parent that when you got angry, they had no, no ability to handle your anger. They would say, you're not angry, get it together. You can't be angry. They overpowered you. They maybe they were abusive at you because they could not handle that anger, whatever that was. That part of them that would react to you began to teach you that that emotion is, there is no space in life for that emotion. There is no space in life for you to feel fear, for you to be angry, for you to feel anxious, for you to feel depressed or discouraged. That when our caregivers are shutting us down throughout our formative years, when we get to adulthood, we may still have those emotions, but they don't need to live with us anymore. We now have that narrative that we are training ourselves. You're fine. Get over it. Stop acting this way. Stop feeling that. That's not true. And we begin to disrespect ourselves. We no longer have our caregiver disrespecting us. We now are disrespecting ourselves. And on top of all that, if our caregiver couldn't handle it, and we became adults and we began to say the same thing to us, guess what? More often than not, we are doing the exact same thing to those that we are taking care of. So when our kids come to us, we have no formula or no strategy or no space for negative. We have no space for anger. We have no space for fear. We have no space for anxiety. We don't know what to do because we don't have any tools because the people around us told us, these are really bad and really scary and you need to get away from it as much as possible. And they disrespected what we needed in life. And I think what's really important is to acknowledge the emotion and to stop putting a moral value on emotions. There is no moral value to emotions. And now let me say, what we do with those emotions are very critical, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. You see, it's, it's the second conversation is what are we going to do with those emotions? But the first conversation is, are you listening? Are you acting? Are you going under the hood? Are you trying to figure out what is going on? Are you dismissing, ignoring, writing off, shoving deep down? Let's just get it deeper down so I don't have to feel that. And for some of you, you're not a real emotional person. And so you don't think about it. But, the, the, but often, those of us that are not emotional have a tendency to write off people that are. Have you ever had someone in your life like that? If so, just, just type yes in the comments. Have you ever had somebody who's not emotional and you're emotional and you get around them and they're like, you're fine, it's fine. I, I, don't, I, I don't have that. Well, just because they're not like you doesn't make them better. And just because they don't experience emotions or, or uh, feel like life is falling apart or feel anxious or feel discouraged, it doesn't make them more spiritual. It doesn't make them more holy. It doesn't make them a better person. It makes them different. And what we want to do in our, again, it doesn't matter what anybody does around us. We are not powerful enough to control other people's experiences of our feelings. So someone says to you, you made me angry. No, no, I didn't make you angry because I'm not powerful enough to go inside of you and choose anger. You did that. Well, you better make me happy. No, I am not powerful enough to make anybody happy. Well, you know, you, you just, you hurt me. You're just, you're a hurtful person. No, you may be hurt, but I'm not a hurtful person. That's the label you put on me. Does that make sense? So as we start to get through all of this learning to look at our emotions with, with a godliness to it, a spiritualness to it, we start to understand that I'm not powerful enough to make you choose any emotion, anything. When you're angry at me, you did that. When you start accusing me, when you start yelling at me, when you start saying things about me, that's all in your yard. That's all within your power. I'm not powerful enough to get you to think, feel, or believe anything about me. Guys, 
any part of you that believes you are powerful enough to change anyone's emotions, thoughts, or choices is a mirage. You are not powerful enough to change anybody. I'm sorry. You might think you're super cute and super talented and super convincing, but the truth is if somebody doesn't want to do it or they want to feel this way about you or they have these thoughts about you, you can do nothing. That is, they are powerful and they get to make those choices about you. And what I see so often in our communities and in our culture and in the female world as well, we have a tendency, we were told that we can control how people feel about us. I don't know about you, but I was taught if I did the right thing and I was a good girl and I said the right things, then people would like me. Maybe. But how many of you have ever been in situations where you're doing all the right things and people don't like you? Has anybody ever been in junior high? <laughs> Has anybody been in 2020 in, uh, in the world? So it's, it's this mirage that if I do the right things and say the right things and I'm act the right way, then people will have the right emotions about me. And it's not true because everything that you say and do will always be about you and everything that they say and do will always be about them. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Like just let it go deep inside you for a minute. Everything you feel, believe, and act on says everything about you and everything that anybody else feels, believes, and acts on says everything about them. And we have to separate both those worlds. And when we separate those worlds, this is where life gets manageable. It gets easy. It gets, it gets abundant, right? John 10, 10. Abundant life. It gets abundant because we are no longer having to be the God of anybody's feelings, anybody's choices, anybody's attitudes. We now just get to steward our lives, our feelings, our attitudes, and our choices. And when that's all we have to do, life gets so much easier. Let me say something to some of you right now. And I've never done this before, so, you know, give me grace to figure this out. But I just want to say, I'm sorry that you didn't get to feel and experience all of your emotions. I'm sorry that you didn't get to be in communities of faith and be allowed to feel anger, fear, shame, all those things that you felt. And I'm sorry that sometimes the leader in your life whether it was your caregiver, your parent, your grandparent, the pastor. I'm sorry that they made you feel that you were broken because you had those emotions or that you were not as spiritual as they were. And what I want you to do is I want you to know that God was saying this to your life and he's saying it. I did not make you wrong. I did not make you broken. I did not make you wanting. I made you exactly how I created you. And I am, I am completely obsessed with the way I made you. I love you. I've given my life for you. I want everything about you. I'm trying to make your life exactly what it needs to be and everything you want it to be. I'm working on your behalf. And I, those emotions are gifts from me to show you what and where I'm working. And this is what the Spirit of God is saying over your life right now. The emotion of fear is not something to dismiss. It's something to look deeper and say, why is this fear here? What have I believed about you? What have I believed about God? What have I believed about myself? That that emotion of fear lingers in my everyday life or this anxiety, what have I believed about you? What have I believed about me? And what have I believed about God that makes me feel anxious about my choices or about my future? And we have to go deeper in those. And when we start to acknowledge and respect those emotions and feelings, the spirit of God, he literally comes in and heals and awakens and revives and restores things that we could not do without the emotions and the feelings that he's given us. Some of you, if you're like me, 
2020 was a year. I had a lot of emotions last year. I have a lot of emotions this year. <laughs> I had a lot of emotions. And all those emotions were not good, bad, right, wrong. They're just emotions. They're just feelings. And now I get to go deeper and wonder, why did I feel that? Why did I think that? Why did I believe that? I get to go deeper with the help of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, you are not too much. God knows what he got when he got you. He is not disappointed. He's not overwhelmed. He is the perfect parent who's coming to help you and I to be the people that he, he created us to be. So most importantly, let's let God use those emotions and not reject those emotions. Yeah. So I want to ask you, do you have any questions about something that you're feeling or experiencing that you would like some insight on? Yes, I will repost this so you guys can see it again. And again, our emotions don't lead. Our spirit does lead, but our emotions are not in the back seat. Our emotions are with us. They are the engine. They're showing us what's going on. And so those lights on our dashboard are our emotions, letting us know what we need to fix. Does that make sense? They are not good. They are not bad. They are not right or wrong. They are just emotions. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. Great deal of emotions for sure. Yep. I'm with you, Claudia. Absolutely. And this is so important. So how do I get past old hurt feelings? Excellent question, Stella. Excellent question. Um, I think the first way that we get healed is we acknowledge. You know, we can't, if we had a broken arm and we don't acknowledge the broken arm, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's broken. So I think the first thing to getting over pain is to acknowledge the pain. And often I think we, we have, um, I want to say residual pain, lingering pain, because we often don't acknowledge it and we don't, um, we're too hard, you know, we, we just, we end up re-injuring ourselves because we expect more from ourselves. Like you're fine, get over it, it's not a big deal. But the truth is, I don't know why or how or how deep your pain is. I just know it's there. And so the first thing you want to do is stop almost shaming yourself for that pain, but acknowledging it. I'm still in hurt. I'm still in pain. This is still affecting me. The second thing that I would recommend that you do is you begin to do some work, which means you're going to write it out. And this is really important. I want you to get it out on paper, everything, all the negative, ugly emotions. I want you to write the story. And this is really important. And I've done this myself, but I would just get a blank piece of paper and I would write the pain and the story, just everything unfiltered. Just get it out. I, whatever language you need to use, whatever analogies, whatever, just no one's going to see this piece of paper. This is for you to get it out of your heart. Whether it was someone who said something to you, whether someone that did something, whether it's about your ex, whether it's about your pastor, I don't know. But I want you to get it all out and just empty. You know, they call it a brain dump. I want you to do a heart dump. And I want you to get it all out. And then I want you to talk to God. I want you to say, God, I want to break all soul ties I have with this pain, this pain that maybe I've kept and nurtured or maybe I'm not healed. And then I want you to take that and I want you to get rid of it. And I mean, burn it, throw it in the fireplace, but almost like in a ceremonial act, I want you to, with your mouth and with your actions, take that and go, I'm no longer going to let this pain define my life. I'm no, gonna, no longer going to let this pain be the thing that keeps me right now. I'm surrendering this right now. And every time it comes my way, I'm going to acknowledge it and I'm going to release it. I'm going to acknowledge, I'm going to release. I see you and I release you. I see you and I release you. And you're going to do that until it begins to go away. You're going to have to do the work, but you can do it. Let's see. Is emotion of guilt of God or Satan? So, um, you feeling being guilty of sin is absolutely of God. He helps us know what we are guilty of, but, but condemnation, the Bible says there is no condemnation in Christ. So there's a difference when we feel guilty, we change. I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Feel that that's a good emotion, whether we, you know, what, what we do with it. So that guilt isn't negative. It's an acknowledgement that I did something I shouldn't have done. And I'm living below the quality in which I should be living, right? The Bible says he that, that, that God convicts the world of sin, but he convicts the righteous of righteousness, which means 
uh, he tells us you're living below your quality. You're living below your, your, uh, I'm not thinking of the right word, but you're living below who you should be. You're not that person. You're not angry. You're not perverse. You're not, no, 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 no. You've been covered in Christ. You've accepted him. You're now a holy and righteous person. So you need to live according to that, which I called you to not from what you once were. And so that's where that dilemma is. So it just gives us guilt, gives us clarity to know why we're, what, what we need to do and what we need to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, right now, anxiety is controlling my life. And I feel ridiculous to admit how much I struggle with this. I fear all things out of my as, are out of my control, and yet I feel as though I have strong faith, but clearly not enough faith or not strong enough. I'm desperate. So Liz, excellent. I have so been there with you, my friend. I have had anxiety. Um, I've had anxiety attacks. I know what it's like. And I would ask you this question. This would be my first question. Is the anxiety to the point where it's controlling your everyday life? Are you able to function? If you cannot function in your anxiety, then you need to seek out help, which is what I had to do. So there's no shame in that. You need to find somebody who has given their life to helping other people through anxiety and fear and all the things. So you need to go talk to somebody. You need to find somebody who loves the Lord, um, somebody who's been trained in this. And you need to go ask, you need to find some tools because you're, you're, it's not for some of us. And for me, it wasn't a faith issue. Like, I, I just want to say that over you, Liz, your anxiety is probably not a faith issue. It's not a spiritual issue. It might be a chemistry issue. It might be uh, a mental stronghold that you're stuck in, but oftentimes it could be just an imbalance that you need to go and find somebody and talk to them and find out why your body and your body chemistry is keeping you in this cycle. So I would say don't hit it at just a faith level. Hit it at a medical issue. Like maybe there's something going on. And for me personally, my postpartum, my three diagnosed postpartum depression sessions or whatever you want to call them, seasons of my life, they were a medical issue. It was not a faith issue. It took faith and courage to go ask for help. It took faith and courage to trust my doctor. It took faith and courage to take medication when I felt like, oh my gosh, people are going to judge me and I'm a pastor and is this wrong and I'm taking this synthetic serotonin. I had to trust God. I had to trust that I was going to have a medical healing and I was going to have a supernatural healing and that they were going to be side by side in the same way, right? So we as spiritual people, we sometimes have to take in faith the medication God you know, the person in our life gave us and I had to have faith to when it was time to get off the medication. So you have to figure out what that faith journey looks like for you, but don't be ashamed. Don't, I want to say, don't, you're working too hard. And he gave us more than we need. And this, this struggle you're having, you know, I just don't want you to work as hard as you're working uh, to live the abundant life. And um, Amanda says, do you have any recommendations for resources for learning about how to acknowledge and engage with emotions after having shut them down throughout childhood? That's an excellent question. I get that counseling is probably the right answer here, but do you have any suggestions? Gosh, you know what? I've never been asked that. And, oh, I love that question. I'm going to have to think about that and I'll come back and comment on that when I get to it. But I don't have anything specifically that I know of. Um, I wrote about it in my book, I do boundaries, but it's just such a small portion compared to what you're talking about. And if you are dealing with anxiety, which is not what Amanda's talking about, but my favorite resource is the book called from panic to power from panic to power. And it's a woman who studies anxiety, has a clinic. And that book was very significant in a lot of in my life and a lot of friends' lives. I've sent it to many people. Another book that I really loved was free fall to fly by Rebecca Lyons. That was an excellent book. I've given it to many of my friends that were dealing with postpartum depression and it's her journey through depression and anxiety. And it's called Free Fall to Fly by Rebecca Lyons. She's a friend and an excellent faith leader. Um, let's see, I wrote a letter to myself um, after a huge hurt as if I was giving advice to a close friend. It really helped. I was able to see clearly the situation and to make and to take my own advice. Ah, Christina, I love that. And here's the truth. You know, sometimes we talk so mean to ourselves, we wouldn't even talk to a friend like that. 
And sometimes we don't even acknowledge what we're, we're so good at acknowledging somebody else's needs and feelings and emotions. And yet we shut ours down. We shut ours out. And so I'm asking you that you would be as kind to yourself as you are to somebody else. And for some of you, that's, that's the breakthrough that you need. Okay. Let's see. Nicole says, I'm realizing I have some unhealed places that I need, that need to be dealt with. This is causing a lot of emotions. I bet. I don't want to suppress them, but how do I process and feel them and still function, right? Um, each day while going through it and facing it. Man, Nicole, I think that's huge. And I know for me, some of the emotion I had was, and the fear, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this, the feel, fear is if I get, if I go down deep and un, unlock the cap off of this, I'm going to feel so much I won't be able to function. Have you guys ever had that feeling? I know I have. If I go deep into this, I may not be able to, to control it. And here's the thing. You're not controlling it anyway. You're already seeing moments in your life that this is coming up to the surface and it's bubbling over into your life. There will be no perfect time in life to deal with past pain and anxiety and fears and childhood stuff. There is no perfect timing. My greatest season it was when I had two kids under the age of two and I'm dealing with the greatest anxiety and depression I've ever dealt with. There is no ideal time. But what you have to look at it as, I'm going to have to go through this for a little bit so that I can be here and be a better person and a stronger uh, person of faith for years to come for me to make it. So if you had a sickness, if you said, okay, you have a sickness, but you can be healed, but we got to deal with this and you're going to be down for a little bit, but we're going to get you better. You'd go, okay, I, it's not ideal. I wouldn't want to do that, but I'm going to do it. And right now you're looking at it as, oh my gosh, I want to go deep, but it's going to be everything. Maybe, but maybe not. God is very gentle and gracious with us. So, you know, you get to take all the time you need. So I know sometimes it can be really scary. And I had a girlfriend of mine, I'll tell you the story. Um, she was one of my closest friends and she had gone through severe abuse growing up. In fact, her words are, there wasn't a man in my life that didn't sexually abuse me growing up. She did not have a dad in the home. She had multiple stepdads and stepbrothers. And when she came to Christ, she married this awesome man, but she had all this pain from her childhood and from her young adult years. She had two babies and I happened to be her babysitter for her second child. And she said, one night her little her littlest had had one of those blowout diapers you know where you just you get you get your child in the middle of the night and he had just had poop all over him just blow blew his diaper out and so she said oh honey and she began to clean up her little son and put him in a fresh diaper and fresh jammies and was holding him in the rocker that night after all the mess and crying and wiping and all the things and as she's holding her son she said the lord said to her stacy this is what I want to do with you. I want to clean you up. And she said, I just wept in the middle of the night. I'm sitting in my rocker, holding my infant son, weeping. And she said, God, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, I know, but I want to do this. If you'll trust me, I want to help you. And she did. She went to a, an incredible counselor for four years and met with her every single week and invested her time and energy and she has this gorgeous family. She's helped many people and she has grandkids and her life is so much wholer than she had, but she did the work. So for some of you, I love you. And that's what I felt like for my own life at times, the Holy Spirit's just saying, I want to clean you up, but you're going to have to trust me. It's going to get a little harder than, it, than it's going to get better, but you have to go through it. Yeah. Guys, I'm almost out of time. I'm going to take two more minutes. I'll take one more question. Um, I, 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 I'm in physical pain for more than a year and I keep declaring that I choose joy, but inside I feel tired and sad because I believe God will heal me. Um, I don't know if I can keep fighting every day for my peace and hope. Yeah. Can I really be joyful without feeling it? Excellent question, Elizabeth. As someone who deals with chronic pain, and I do, I have migraines multiple times a week and I have chronic pain that I have not had any relief from. And please don't send me your lotions and potions. I promise I have a doctor. I have a neurologist. I do everything I know how to do. I know that at times I can't, I mean, I have a friend who will literally text me, you're going to make it. You can do it. 
And sometimes I feel great. And other times I feel like I can't make it and the pain is too strong and I feel weary. But what I do know is, is that faith is not a feeling. Faith is a choice. And ultimately your faith, I know biblically our faith can be connected to our healing, but I don't want you to feel discouraged that you don't have enough faith to be healed. Cause I just, I, I've seen the church do this so wrong and it really leaves those that are trying to be healed and want to be healed in such a place of discouragement and shame. If you are not healed and you want to be healed, you are doing nothing wrong. Like, I just want you all to hear me for a minute. If you are in pain and you want to be healed and you're asking God to heal you and you are not healed, it is not a faith issue. You're doing all the right things. Sometimes Jesus healed people. Sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he said, ye have little faith. And sometimes he didn't. There's even a person in the Bible that said, I don't have the faith. And, and they said, so help my unbelief. For some of us, it's help my unbelief. But for many of us, it's part of the journey. Paul had a thorn. He cried out three times to get rid of it. And we don't know if God actually ever did that. We don't know if it was a chronic pain, but I often think about the own pain that I experience. And I say, God, let your will be done. Jesus in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. I can't take the pain away. I can do everything I know how to do, but uh, I, I, the, the conversation of me trusting you, believing you in faith, that conversation's over. You know that I love you. You know that I do whatever you ask me to do. So now I'm just asking for grace and strength to get me through the days that I feel like I'm not going to make it. And you're still here, Elizabeth. You're still here. I'm still here. And if God does, or if he wants to heal us on earth, then he'll do that. If he wants to heal us in heaven, uh, the good news is we all, we all get healed in heaven. We all get a new body. It's all coming, whether it's on this side of heaven or on the next side of heaven, we will all get a new, a new body. So I love you guys. I pray for healing, Elizabeth. I ask God that he would come and heal your body radically and, and wholly um, this, in this season. I love you guys. I hope that this spoke to you. If this spoke to you, would you do me a favor? Would you share it? Share it on your socials. Let other people hear about this. Let's get people um, respecting their emotions and seeing their feelings and emotions from God. And let's get that word out there that that's how he feels about it. I hope you guys love the I Do Boundaries study. We are on day 10. We have five more days. It's not too late to jump into our I Do Boundaries study. And the videos will be up for weeks and weeks. So if you want to start it, you can start it today, tomorrow, the next week, and you can still participate. But you cannot miss out. And you don't need a book to participate. So again, just jump in and make sure there's anybody you think that this would speak to. You guys are always good at this. You help me. This is how the word gets out. So thank you for sharing it. I love you all. I'm going to go feed my family dinner and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. At I do boundaries day 11. Bye-bye.